Greetings once again in that name that is above every name, for the Bible declares that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue must confess that he is Lord. Oh, how blessed we are. How wonderful it is to be in the house of the Lord one more time. Amen. In this very festival season, and uh, as they would say from the world, it's so the most wonderful time of the year and how blessed we are. I am delighted to see all of you who have gathered together today to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And the Lord has gave, given us another wonderful Lord's Day in which we have come to lift his name up and celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. And so we welcome you, SMZ, welcome Philadelphia and vicinity, and we welcome those who are watching from across the country and around the world. Amen. We are delighted to have those persons who have joined us today. Uh, Deacon Wilmore, all the way from Newcastle, Delaware, is online and in person. Welcome, Sister Karen White. Amen. We're delighted to have you. Welcome, Sister Barbara Cherry is on board. Welcome. Amen. Brother June Coe is on board. Welcome. Sister Vicki Parker is on board all the way from Sylvania, Georgia, and also Deacon Charles Parker. Amen. Welcome, Sister Brother Gerald Young is on board. Sister Gail Small is on board. Welcome, Sister Hattie Foster is on board. Welcome, Sister Paulette Wilson is on board. Welcome, Sister Dollar Robinson Jacks is on board. Delighted to have you on board. Delighted to have you, Sister Keita Blackwell, all the way from Baltimore, Maryland, is on board. Welcome, Sister Sheila Adams is on board. Welcome, Sister Betty Trimble is on board, all the way from Statesboro, Georgia. Welcome, Sister Olivia McMillan is on board, all the way from Maryland. Amen. Welcome, Sister Mary L. Smith is on board. Welcome, Studio M is on board. Amen. We are delighted to have all of those persons who have joined us, and what a wonderful time of the year is, and how blessed we are. Amen. Let us stand at this time. Uh, the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Our congregational hymn. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus, the light of the world. 
Good morning, Second Mount Zion. Our scripture for today is Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, and then drop down 7 through 10. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in those days of Herod the king, behold, there was a wise man from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where he that is born, the king of Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in in all Jerusalem with him. Drop down verse 7. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, search diligently for the young child. When ye have found him, bring the word again, that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy, the word of God. Heavenly Father, we come now in the most humble way that we know how. We come, O Lord, thanking you for all the blessing that you have bestowed upon us. We come, Lord, thanking you for this day, for we know that it's only you that can make us stand. O Lord, we come uh, uh, not asking you to come into this place, but we know that you are already here. So we are inviting you, O Lord, to make yourself known. For we know if you make yourself known, we'll be able to worship you in truth and in spirit. O Lord, we ask you to bless all of those who might be on the way. Bless all that are under uh, my poor, weak voice. We know that you got all power in your hand. So we ask now, Lord, that you give us strength that we might be able to worship you in the way that you would have us to go. And know, oh Lord, all of those who don't know you, we ask that you guide them and teach them. Let them know that you are God and God all by yourself. Oh Lord, these and all of the blessings we ask in thy son Jesus' name, amen.
Praise his holy name. Uh, don't, don't fool me now. Let's, let's just make sure that, that what we are saying is not empty words. Because if you love to praise him, uh, you ought to show some signs. Thank you, choir, for singing to the glory of God and uh, Amen. You look so good this morning. Amen. In your red and black. Amen. Y'all looked all matching up today. Amen. What a wonderful, what a wonderful time. And amen. What a wonderful look. Amen. And so we are just delighted. Uh, amen. And I praise God. Praise God for these moments. I figured that since I have not preached in three weeks, that y'all wouldn't mind hearing me twice this morning. Amen. Church, church school and, uh, and the sermon. Now I was, now I was, now, now I was just kidding. Uh, uh, Deacon Simpson said to me, I, I, I need you to, I need you to take my class. I don't mind being in service today, but I'm not just, I'm not feeling 100%, so I don't, I don't want to teach the Sunday school lesson. Uh, and I said, uh, I said, uh, the, uh, Reverend, Reverend Chris, I said, I said, I got you. Amen. Because I was taught 
Deacon Hagler. I was taught to be prepared. You know, my, my pastor that I sit under, he said, he said, if I'm in the middle of my sermon, watch me now. He says, if I'm in the middle of my sermon and if I get sick or fall out, he said, you should be able to complete my sermon. That's, that's how I'm so in tune with the ministry that you ought to be. And that reminds me, I need to see all of the deacons just for a moment, just for about two or three minutes right after immediately following the worship service, after we do some pleasantries and shake some hands. Let me see you for about three minutes today. Amen? Amen, amen. So we ought, we ought to always, always, always uh, be prepared. And, and, and what an on-time lesson. Yes. John prepares the way. That's our church school lesson. John, John prepares the way. Mm. Amen. And in order for him to prepare the way, he has to be prepared himself. John has spent about 10 years in preparation. John's been spending the last 10 years in preparation and meditating on the message that God gave him. How much time do you spend in preparation? That's a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer it. Just do like Arsenio Hall say, hmm. <laughs> you know, sometimes, sometimes I watch, I watch the people, Sister Brooke, Alice Brooks, as they come in, and uh, you know, we in a Sister Borden, we in a new era, and we in a new kind of situation where, you know, you used to could come in any kind of way and any time and nobody not know it. But now if you do it, folk all over the world see how unorganized you are. And lackadaisical you are. And so they turn to somebody else who's more organized and, you know, and that's why I admired the choir this morning. They so uniform and uh, they, look, they look so good and they... They sound so good. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. John, John prepares the way for Jesus Christ. And in order for you to give a message about Jesus Christ, you've got to be prepared yourself. John was prepared. And when you are prepared, you don't have to be intimidated or nervous about what you're about to do. It's all right to be nervous, but you ought to be so, you ought to be so used to being prepared and so you're just used to being nervous until it looked like to other folk that nervousness don't bother you. Because I'm nervous right now. I'm, I'm just as nervous because I got to say some stuff. And uh, it's going to be kind of like John the Baptist. John the Baptist had to deliver an unpopular message. Did, did y'all hear me? I said John the Baptist had to deliver an unpopular message. But he was so prepared yes, until he was still bold enough to say what the Lord had said unto him. Wow. And he uses this, this, he uses this Jewish formula. And you know what the Jewish formula is? And the word of the Lord came unto me. But John, the word of the Lord came upon him. 
And see, there's a difference in the word of the Lord coming to you and the Lord, word of the Lord coming upon you. Because when the word of God come upon you, it pressures you into service to say what need to be said. I believe I will. I say the word of the Lord came upon him and it pressed him. It pressed him to the point where, where he, he had to say what the Lord said unto him. The word of the Lord came, let, let, let's see, let's see. The word of the Lord came unto him. Yeah, that's in, that's in chapter one. The word of the Lord came unto him. And uh, he uses that Jewish formula and that Jewish formula from the Old Testament prophets. Because if you read Isaiah 1, 1, you know what it says? And the word of the Lord came unto me. And if you read Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, you know what it says? And the word of the Lord came unto me. And if you go to the minor prophet, uh, 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 to the minor prophet Hosea, you know what it says? And the word of the Lord came unto me. And if you go to Amos 1, 1, you know what it says? And the word of the Lord came unto me. God's word, God's word is always active. Did you hear me? I said the word of the Lord is active. How is it that we can hear so much word and quote so much word and it's not active in our lives? Same reason that John delivered this message. He didn't deliver a message that was abstract and away from folk that they could not understand. And a word, and a word that uh, didn't mean nothing to anybody. You know, whenever I, deliver, whenever I deliver a message and it knocks on your door and comes and sit right next to you, you know what you say? He's meddling now. He's talking about folk now. The word of the Lord was not just simply a vehicle of time and, in tr and truth. It was a word in and to specific human circumstances. If the word does not address your human circumstances, the word is no good. It's a void word if it does not address your human circumstances and if it doesn't address your, your, your circumstances that you are in right now. The circumstances, it was very dark very dark in Jerusalem. There had been no word from the Lord for 400 years. There has been 400 silent years and John the Baptist comes on the scene with a message. And Luke, 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 Luke is interesting in that, uh, 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 in, in not only in in the coming of John, because we saw that in the past couple of weeks, we saw John the Baptist coming, but Luke is also interested in the message the word of God comes to bring. He's interested in the message of the word. And if you don't get the message of the word and just hear words, you are no different from the scribes and Pharisees who could quote the Bible from cover to cover, but did not have the spirit of that word, and the spirit of that word did not affect their daily lives. And I stop out to ask somebody today, have the, have the word really affected your daily life? Well, let me just give you, let me just give you the message of the word that John preached. The word of God came. John baptism was, rep, uh, and message was repentance of sin. And that's an always an un unpopular message, repentance of sin. And you know what? John finally lost his life 
because of that kind of message? Most of us are not really willing to suffer for the word of God. We would rather be comfortable and popular with other people rather than the, God, rather than the word of God. And so John's baptism was a message of repentance of sin. From, from the power of sin, deliverance from the power of sin. In other words, the power of sin broken in your life. In other words, when you've been delivered from sin, you just don't habitually do the things that you used to do. You, you, you know, you may still do them, but you don't do them as much as you used to. It's not a, it's not, it's no longer a habit. And so John was this, John had this unpopular message like, and, and, and John's, and let me just run ahead of myself and say, say that John's message is just as relevant today as it was in his day. Because all of us need to repent from something. But then some of us are like the scribes and Pharisees. I ain't got nothing to repent for. I ain't, I ain't do nothing. In other words, other folk ought to be repenting and not me. Because I done, I done did everything right and I've been, you know, you, 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 know, you know, I am. You know, I do good to other folk and I, I give and I give my charity, amen. But salvation is not determined by your works. Let me say that again. Salvation is not determined by your works. And Luke concludes the Isaiah. He concludes with the prophet Isaiah and all, even though he was dealing with Jerusalem and Judea and about 150 mile radius, but he's, he concludes with the prophet Isaiah and says, and all men should see God's salvation together. All means all. That's how, come, that's how come John the Baptist's message of repentance is just as relevant today because all flesh shall see it together. Amen. And I know you're sitting there with your Christmas outfits on and you look good and you're smelling good and all of that stuff, but you still need to repent from something. And then, then we drop down to the latter portion of the message of this, of this, of this uh, uh, latter portion of John's uh, uh, message. And, uh, you know, starting at verse 15, question is, and the confusion whether such a radical prophet as John might be the Messiah. John was clear who he was. I mean, he could have snuck some credit in because after all, he was kin to Jesus. He could have he snuck some credit in and got a little credit himself. But when they asked John, who are you? John, John I told you John been ponder, pondering this message for 10 years. John, John thought to himself, he said, I'm too, I'm too late to be associated with the prophets. And I'm too early to be associated with uh, uh, the apostles. I'm too late, I'm a prophet, but I'm too late to be associated with the prophets and too early to be associated with the apostles. And so John says, I'm just a, I'm just a voice. John, John was clear about his purpose and his message. 
Watch the text as it, as it unfolds. They was wondering how, who, who is this John? You know, he gave, you know, you know, sometimes we, sometimes folk give a good speech. And we start wondering, if, is he going to be a preacher? Or, or is she going to be a preacher? And then when you realize that that ain't your calling, now you all messed up. You know, Reverend Bruce would always ask us before he ordained us as a deacon, he said, now, he said, now, if you accept this, you will always be a deacon. And then we smile. He said, but, but either you're going to be a good deacon or a bad one. Once you embrace that kind of calling, once you embrace the calling of a preacher, either you're going to be a good one or a bad one. Yeah, if you accept that calling. And so they were wondering, because John made all of these good speeches and they sound good. He was, kind, he was almost like the Apostle Paul. When King Agrippa said, man, you sound good. You wax eloquent. He said, you almost persuaded me to be a Christian. Folk will listen to you and get excited about you, but they don't embrace the message. And you know that doesn't bother me. It concerns me, but it doesn't bother me because they got excited about Jesus' message. And he was the word. They got excited about him. And uh, they were amazed at his teaching. But there's nowhere where the scribes and Pharisees ever embraced his message. And Jesus had to say to his disciples, he said, now I don't want you to be like them. He says, except your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will in no wise enter into the kingdom of God because the scribes and Pharisees were still listening to John's message. John's message was only a message that dealt with the outside. The outside and the attitude. And John tells you plainly, I am not him. I am not the one. And they still wondering if John is the one. He tells you that I am not the one. Verse 15 says, and the people were in expectation of all men amused in their hearts of John, whether he was the Christ or not. whether he was the Christ or not. Look at verse 16. John answered them all. Watch me now. I baptize you with water. Listen to John now. He's clear. You don't have to figure out what he's saying. You don't have to add on to what he's saying. You know, how, you know how it is when we write, read the Bible and say, and we, and we use our own interpretation and say, this is what the Bible means? You know, Sunday school teachers of old, and they did a good job of getting us where we are. They used to read, they used to read a verse and then look at you and say, what you get out of that verse? No, no, it ain't about what you get out of it. It's what, it, what the word, word, verse means. And John answered them all. He said, I baptize you with water, but there is one coming after me who is more powerful than I am. Because the word and the message that I have is repentance, turn around, but only Jesus can change you from the inside outside. I can deal with the outside, I can deal with your attitude, but I can't deal with your sin problem. Only the one that's coming behind me can deal with your sin problem. He is the one that has the power to do it. Yes, sir. Oh, 
He's the one that has the power to do it. That's how come Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you by yourself, but I'm going to send you somebody in my name. I'm going to send the Holy Ghost who can get on the inside. It is clear. John, John said, my job is to point you and get you to Jesus Christ. And once you get to Jesus Christ, he is the one that's more powerful than I am. And so he is the one that can, that can cleanse you from the inside to the outside. He is the one that is worthy of your reverence. And most of us, we are more afraid of each other. than Jesus Christ. I am not the one that's worthy of your reverence. And I am, I am clear about that. I am clear because of the message that I have from the Lord. I am clear that it's going to upset some of y'all. Depending upon what I'm talking about. John says... He is worthy of your reverence. He is the one that you ought to reverence. He is the one that you ought to be afraid of. But not only is he more powerful than I am, and not only is he more, he, he is worthy of reverence, he would baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. And now John gives a prediction of the Holy Ghost. Yeah, the coming of the Spirit. It is, it, it is to have the effect of fire. Did y'all hear me? I said the Holy, the Holy Ghost is to have the effect of fire. Yeah, yeah, let me see what else John says here. John, John, John says, uh, I am not worthy, but he's the one that's worthy, verse 16, uh, uh, to unloose. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let me, use, let me use the everyday word. I am not worthy to untie his shoes. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. I am not the one. I am delivering you a message of repentance. And the only way that you can get to God is through Jesus Christ by repentance. He says, you are to repent. And when you repent, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. And then he used an agricultural word. He used uses an agricultural word, he says his winning fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and the gone of the wheat into his barn. What is he saying? He's saying that when he come, the Holy Ghost will be like, you know, but Jim, we used to save the seeds from one year to the next. You know, we used to save the corn from this year to plant next year, but there would be a whole lot of trash and stuff in it. And, uh, and Daddy would take a, take a wide sheet, you know, one of the sheets that we put cotton in, and he would take the, and he would, he would take the bucket of corn, shell corn, and throw it up. He'd wait till the wind is blowing. And he would throw it up in the air, and the good kernels would fall on the sheet, and the trash would blow away. And so that's what John, that, that's what John was saying here. He said he, in his thrusting floor, in his thrusting floor, he would throw it up, the wheat up into the air, and the wheat would come down, and the wind would blow all the trash away. Yeah. And, and, and he said, that's what the Holy Ghost is like. That's what the effect of the fire is like. The fire is like purifying. It's like it, the fire, the Holy Ghost is active in saving us. He's active in saving us, purifying us, judging us. And see, when Messiah comes, 
That would mean also the availability of the spirit ministry. When the Messiah comes, John said, the one that's coming after me is more powerful than I am, more worthy than I am. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. That means that the Holy Spirit's ministry is available. And every time somebody repent and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he gives them the gift of the Holy Spirit. Good God Almighty. And, and he gives them the gift of the Holy Spirit. And once he gives them the gift of the Holy Spirit, it not only deals with the outside, but it starts making the inside look like the outside. Because I, I know some beautiful folk. I know some nice looking folk until they open their mouth. And then they don't look so good no more. But the Holy Spirit, see, will not only deal with that outside, but the Holy Spirit will deal with the inside and begin to work you from the inside to the outside. And not only will you be beautiful on the outside, but you'll be beautiful on the inside. And you know some beautiful folk too, until they open their mouth. You know some beautiful folk until you, till, till you catch a whiff of their attitude. And their attitude and their mouth makes them not look so good but the Holy Spirit's ministry. John, John says there's another ministry. My ministry is ending once the Messiah gets here. My ministry is done. And then the Messiah says that, that when my ministry is done, then there will be the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And you know, my brothers and sisters, you, you know what era we're in now? The era of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You cannot sep separate Jesus from the Holy Spirit. You cannot separate him from John the Baptist's message. John the Baptist says, I've got a ministry to and the one that's coming after me, he will release you from the power of sin. See, we still got the presence of sin in our lives. That's how come we rebel when, when, we, are, when, we, are called to re, when we are called to surrender. Y'all hear me now? Because we live, we live in the, in the individualistic society. And I do whatever I want to do. I worship like I want to do. I read my Bible when I want to. And when somebody tells you that you are to surrender unto Jesus, you rebel. And I'm going to say something later on about surrendering to Jesus because it kind of suggests that Jesus is in charge and ain't nobody in charge of me. Now you may not so be so bold to say it, but you say it in your attitude. And so Holy, the Holy Spirit's ministry, ministry will work you from the inside to the outside The Redeemer, and then we see the Redeemer in John's preaching. Watch this. No wonder he's called John the Baptist. Yeah, deacons. Do you know why he calls John the Baptist? Because he closed like a Baptist preacher. Look who's the Redeemer in his message. You know who the Redeemer in his message is? He was born in Bethlehem. <laughs> Yes, sir. Brought up in Nazareth. Right. 
baptized and this is the redeemer in his message baptized in the Jordan performed miracles in Galilee wept over Jerusalem and prayed in Gethsemane and late one Friday evening went to Calvary's rugged cross and he died John talks about the redeemer I was redeemed out on a hill called Calvary my, when, 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 when my bond was paid And when my salvation was secure, he died. John closes like a Baptist preacher. The Redeemer in his message is none other than the Son of God, Jesus Christ our Lord. John says, I'm not the one. But there's one coming after me who's mightier than me, who's powerful than me, who's worthy of your praise. Amen. And the way John prepares his way is with a message of repentance. John's message is not complete. If you only accept John's message, John's message is not complete. But the one coming after me, he will fulfill the promise. And so he said, let every valley, yeah, those who are down and in the degradation of their sin. He said, let it repent and come up. And he said, every mountain shall be brought. Those, those, those who are arrogant must be humbled. And John says, when you repent, then the one coming after me, who's mightier than I am, he is the redeemer and he is the one that brings deliverance. He is the one that brings salvation. Amen. As Deacon Simpson would say, that's all I got for you. wanna praise you come on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever for all, for all you done for me for me blessings and blessings and glory and honor and honor they
mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. We greet you in that name that is above every name. And for the Bible declares that, that the name of Jesus 
every knee shall bow and every tongue must confess that he is Lord. God, we thank you for another opportunity. We thank you for these hearers and worshipers who have gathered together today to hear what your word has to say unto us in these times. We pray now that the word will find lodging into our hearts. And we be not just hearers of your word, but doers of the word also. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That we may apply the preached word to our daily lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. amen. And amen. There is a word that's found in uh, Matthew chapter two and verses one through three and seven through 10. Drop down. Listen to the words of the text. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? Uh, for we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, Bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed and behold the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. The word of God. And for a few moments, I, I want to talk about who's in charge. Who's really in charge? It's a question that's many of us are pondering these days, particularly in and on the political scene. They really, the question is who's in charge? Even though 45 is no longer in office, it looks like he's still in charge. A whole lot of folk still looks to him for instructions and directions. Even in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, they're fighting over who's in charge of the Congress because there were several Democrats who died 
which tilted the scale looked like to the Republicans. And so they want to know who's in charge. And everybody is trying to be in charge. In the year that Jesus was born, and Luke, 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 Luke gives us a more detailed report of the political and religious scheme. Luke gives us the emperor who was in charge. He gives us the governor who was in charge. And he gives us the two high priests that was in charge. Annas and Caiaphas. They always called them together, almost like, almost like the Republican Party now. Yeah, whoever's in charge, they still call somebody else's name who really has the influence. Caiaphas was the high priest, but his father-in-law, Annas, was the power behind the throne. He was what we would call, Sister Diane, the 1% today. I don't care who's in charge, the 1% still hold the purse strings. Yeah, you remember when Mitt Romney was running and he exposed the 1%, he talked about the 1% who's still controlling the purse strings. And, and when we come down to the year of where Jesus was born, you got Caiaphas, it says Annas and Caiaphas, the influence and power behind the throne and the one who occupying the seat. But Annas was still pulling the purse strings, and Herod, uh, the king, he had manipulated his way with Rome, with his crafty ideas, with, with Rome, and, and was in charge. And, and since he was in charge, and a Jew, he knew the scripture. And so he was in a position that really didn't belong to him. And you know how come I know? Because he was an Edomite. He was the one, he was the one that fought against Jacob. Jacob and Esau, they were never on the same page. And Herod had manipulated himself to become king, and he was a tyrant. He killed one of his wives, two of his oldest sons, who, 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 threatened, who threatened his throne. And, and that's why the text says that, that when Herod, the king, heard it in verse 2, 3, all of Jerusalem was troubled with him. Right now, almost all America are troubled because 45 wants to run again. And that troubles a whole lot of folk. And whenever, whenever the political began to control or the secular began to control the spiritual, you know you're, in, you know you're messed up. You know it's corrupt. Because there are those who say that they are the evangelical right. They will go along with anything he says. Whenever the secular began to control the spiritual, the world is in trouble. And now we don't know who's in, in charge. And... Uh, uh, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Herod was not born in Bethlehem of Judea, nor was he from the tribe of Judah. He knew he was in the wrong place, and so he'll do anything to stay there. And you know how sometimes folk get in the wrong position? And they know they don't belong there. They know they are not worthy. But once they get in that position, it's hard to get them out. Yeah. And so 
Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. In those days, Herod, the king, behold, wise men came from the east, and they came to Jerusalem. And guess what they say? Where is he who's born king of the Jew? Here is somebody that was born king of the Jew. He, he did not inherit it from his family. He did not inherit it from his daddy, but Jesus was born king of the Jews. And Herod heard that, and, and they said, we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. In other words, we have saw the light. We saw his light all the way in the east, and we've been following the light for two years. We see a whole lot of lights during this season. And a lot of us are following artificial light. And if y'all doubt that, there are folk come from all over the world to come to Times Square to see them flip the switch in New York. And not only in New York, but right downtown, Philadelphia. Folk come from all around to see the light, but that's artificial light. Jesus says that I am the light of the world. And, it, and this time of the year, it ought to remind us of the light of the world. When we see all of the light all around us and we put up lights in our houses and lights around our houses and light in our jobs and on, on our, in our yard, it ought to remind us of who is the real light, the light of the world. And that's how come, that's how come Matt, that's how come Luke names all of the people that was in charge of the whole world because Jesus is the light of the world. Yeah. And so the lights, they ought to remind us. They ought to remind us, even though it's a wonderful time of the year, it, they ought to remind us that Jesus is the light of the world. Walk in the light, beautiful light. Shine all around us by day and by night. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, watch this. Light demands attention. Light demands that you look at it. Yeah, yeah. Light demands attention. Why, why do you think Herod is so interested in the, the one who was born? Who's, Herod is on David's throne that does not belong to him. It belonged to somebody from the line, lineage of David. It, re, it belongs to Jesus Christ, and he is born king of the Jew. And when you follow this Christmas story, you will discover uh, that, that Herod is so insecure until he puts, sends out a decree that all boy babies, because I don't want to miss him who is born king of the Jew, all boy babies that are uh, uh, two years and under, he says, kill them, because I don't need a ri rivalry kingdom. Yeah. I don't need a rivalry king. I don't need, even though a baby, he's a baby, and Herod tries to kill a baby, y'all. You know that's wicked. He tries to kill a baby. And, and I told you, I think I told you on uh, some time ago, I told you that the kingdom of God comes with power. Even this baby who is the center of God's kingdom, Herod has the entourage and the power of the throne, but he can't even kill a baby. He sends out a decree, and Jesus says, Jesus says, Jesus says, says to Herod, 
uh, Jesus says to Mary and Joseph, take the baby into Egypt among his people, folk who look like him, and he, he can't be discovered. <laughs> that, that's a plug for Jesus. J Jesus must have been black. Because if he's among the Egyptians, which is really in Africa, maybe he's dark-skinned. And if he's among his people and he cannot be hid, maybe he looked like those folk down there. You know, sometimes I go, sometimes I, sometimes I go different places and they say, oh, you sure you ain't so-and-so? You look just like somebody I know because of our social assimilations. And the person don't even have to be my biological brother. I, I know somebody who, who I, it just looks like I know you. And so Jesus, Jesus, God told Mary and Joseph, take Jesus down into Egypt. And he, he went down to Egypt so he could be hid. Herod, with all of the entourage, came, kill Jesus. Because Jesus is the light of the world. And light demands attention. You ever been in a place and you, you know, we sang the song, Sister Joanne, let this little light of mine shine. If you let your light shine, you don't have to be blowing no trumpet and letting folk know who you are. They will discover who you are because they will see the light that is within you and you force them to take a, pay attention to you because your light is shining. But watch this. Not only does light demands our attention, you know what else light does? Light reveals our flaws. It revealed the falsehood about Herod. Herod said, where was he born? They said, Bethlehem of Judea. It's written in the prophets that he would be born. Yeah, but isn't Bethlehem one of the least of the providence of Judea? He was born in Bethlehem of Judea. And so that exposes who Herod is. It exposes him as a false king. Because he wasn't born in Bethlehem of Judea. He was not from the lineage of David. He was a false king. Who are you perpetrating today? Spirit-filled person? Are you the true light? Are you, the, are you a reflector of the true light? Or are you just faking it? Are you the artificial light that you can flip it on and flip it off? Light reveals your flaws. Je Jesus didn't do nothing. Jesus ain't concerned about Herod. Jesus is a baby born in Bethlehem of Judea, and now Herod is upset, and all of Jerusalem is upset with him because they don't know what that crazy man going to do. America is upset right now because they don't know what that crazy man's going to do. He's a t intimidated. You see, everybody else will fight, but he'll be somewhere in a room in the White House looking at everybody. He's intimidated because he's a bully. Herod was a bully because the light, the true light of Jesus Christ reveals his flaws. He's from the wrong tribe. He's from the wrong lineage. He's from the lineage that fought against David. He's an Edomite. Yeah. And so not only does, does light command our attention, light makes sure that you 
pay attention to it. You can't wait until the morning light adorns. I'm going to get up in the morning. It's already morning, but you wait until the light and the light demands your attention. The light causes you to rise in the morning. The light is what causes you to go about your normal day, not, 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 not in darkness. And so, and so, and so not, only, not only does light command our attention and reveals our flaw, but light overpowers darkness. That, that's how come you don't have to talk. That's how come you don't have to say who you are. Because if it's the real light, it will overpower darkness. It will overpower darkness. Good God Almighty. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this, Harry Hawkins. Jesus died out on a hill called Calvary. And they put him down in a dark grave. And guess what? On the third day, he got up. The light overpowered darkness. Because you know when he was out on the cross? Because huh, two suns can't shine at the same time. And so the S-O-N was hanging on the cross, so the S-U-N had to go out. Because he overpowers darkness. Light overpowers darkness. You can come in here at night and you can flip the switch and this is just artificial light and the darkness disappears. And since you, since you ought to let your little light shine wherever you go, you, you, ought, to, you, you ought to distinguish the darkness. Just by your light. And then finally, light, light offers guidance. Guidance. Yeah. They've been following him. For two years, they've been following this light, this unusual light. I mean, they were, they, they, they were stargazers and, and astrologers who studied the stars, but they saw an unusual light, and they followed the light. And when they got to Jerusalem, they said, where is he who is born king of the Jews? He's born king. He was not made king. He did not manipulate himself to be king, but he was born the king. And that upsets Herod because he see him as his rivalry. But light offers guidance. You know, Couture, <coughs> Chanel, when you are training your kids to go to the bathroom by themselves, you put this little light in the plug and so they can follow the light at night. Because they are guided by the light, and then when you get, and then when you get older, you use that light again. Because, because now you got, you, you got high blood pressure and sugar diabetes, Debbie, and you don't need to be stomping your toe. Yeah, yeah. And so that, that light, that light in the bathroom, Kind of, when we get up at night, it kind of guides us the way we're supposed to be. Light offers guidance. Yeah. And so the, these, these wise men, they've been following the light for almost two years. They've been following the light of the world. They saw the light from the east, and we have come to worship him. And when they got to Jerusalem, and Herod was upset, he called all of his wise men in and the magi in, and he said, where, where is he who is born king of the Jews? Where should he be born? They said, Bethlehem of Judea. And they said, he said, go and search diligently for the child, and then, then when you find him, come back and bring me word that I might come and worship him. And that lets me know that everybody who say they come to worship don't really come to worship. 
but they come to kill somebody. Or you may not use a knife or a gun, but you will use, you will kill a person's character. You will use words to kill a person. You don't come to worship. You come to kill somebody, and you are under the pretense that I've come to worship. Herod knows that he wants to kill Jesus. And so God reveals to Mary and Joseph to take the baby into Egypt. And then when Herod died, I said when Herod died, Jesus came back to the place where he thought he was in charge. And I got a question for you today. Now who's really in charge? Oh yes, my brothers and my sisters. We've gone through a whole lot of stuff. And we've survived slavery. But I want to know who's in charge. The government thought that they was in charge with the Tuskegee men. But I tell you, black men are still here. Black men are still being responsible. And I want to know who's really in charge. Yes, Lord. We've gone through Jim Crow. But we're still standing. Stripped of our culture. Forced to speak a strange language but we're still here. And so my question is today, at who's really in charge? Yeah, many of the slave masters, uh, they're dead and sleeping in their grave, but we're still here. And I wanna know who's really in charge. And I don't know about you, yeah, but I tell you, my brothers and my sisters, uh, I'm going to follow the light. I'm going to follow the light of Jesus during this Christmas season. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine all around me. I'm going to let it shine all in my neighborhood. And I'm going to let it shine because can't nobody put the light out. And I am a reflector of the light of the world just like the moon reflects the light of the sun and just like the stars reflect the lights of the sun we are supposed to reflect the light of Jesus Christ we ought to let this little light shine and every now and then we might have to be in some darkness but keep on letting your light shine for I heard Jesus says you don't have to put your light under a bushel uh, but you ought to let it shine because somebody uh, right where you used to be uh, they need to see your light uh, some drug addict uh, need to see your light uh, some dope dealer uh, need to see your light uh, some prostitute uh, need to see your light uh, some grudging person uh, somebody that's holding grudges uh, and some backbiter uh, they need to see your light and you ought to let your light shine. It's a wonderful time of the year to let your light shine. I don't know how you feel about it, but I'm going to let this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine because I know who's in charge because I watched him when he was in charge out on a hill called Calvary. They tried to kill him but they couldn't kill him because he was still in charge even he some summons the demon of death to come up to the cross and the demon of death didn't want to mess with Jesus because Jesus was still in charge and the reason that death knows that Jesus is in charge he saw Lazarus the other day and Jesus said Lazarus 
has come forth. He's still in charge. Hey, hey, they pissed him in the side, but he's still in charge. They ribbed him in his feet. They nailed nails in his hand, but he's still in charge. They put a crown of thorn on his head, but he's still in charge. And when, 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 when my bond had been paid, yes, Lord, he was still in charge. And when my imprisonment had been terminated, he was still in charge. And when, when he delivered me from my sins, he was still in charge. But he said, I got to fulfill the scripture, and so I got to die. Come on, death, and take me so I can die. But death said, I can't mess with you because light overpowers darkness and you've got the power. But Jesus said that I gotta mess with you. Reached down to the foot of the cross, took the demon of death, drew him up to the cross and sucked all of the fiery venom out of death so he could die. And then I heard, yes, I heard, I heard Paul said, oh, death was swallowed up in victory. And when he swallowed death, they took him down off the cross. They put him six foot down in the earth where it was real dark. They sealed the tomb. It was real dark. But I tell you that, that the light overpowers darkness. He stepped up on resurrection morning, said, I got all the power. Oh, power, power in my hand. Hey, hey, light overpowers darkness. I'm going to follow the light. I'm going to follow him. Because one of these old days, I might have to lay down in a cold, dark grave. But I'm going to follow him in resurrection. When Gabriel sound the judgment trumpet, I'm going to get up out of them old dusty graves. And my feet will strike the narrow inclines of God's unclouded glory and then I'm going on home I'm going on home I'm going to sit down with the father and chat with the son and tell him about the well that I just come from but he'll still be in charge hey hey is he in charge of your life you ought to let him lead you from earth to glory he will lead you one way he'll lead you out of no way is there anybody here who's willing to follow the light now tell me who's really who's really in charge after two years he comes back to where Herod thought that he was in charge. You tell me. Who's really in charge? You ought not be driven by economics. You ought not be driven by the lights. You ought not be driven by this season. But you ought to be driven by the light or guided by the light of the world. See, the only reason that Christmas and Easter is separated for economic purposes, for folk to fleece you. Christmas and Easter is two sides of the same coin because he was born to die. I said he was born to die. But in spite of his death, he's still in charge. Because he is the light of the world. And you and we are reflectors of the light. Just like the moon and the stars reflect the light of the sun, we are to reflect the light of Jesus Christ everywhere we go. 
as we are standing upon our feet. The door of the church is open for church membership and Christian discipleship. The opportunity is yours and the invitation is extended to you. And if I were you today, I would be guided by that light. That light will never lead you wrong if you follow the light. The wise men, the magi said, we've seen his star in the east and we've come to worship him. We've come to worship him doing, not only doing this Christmas season, but in every season we ought to worship him. The invitation to church membership and Christian discipleship is extended to you, to you and to you. God bless you. Oh, yes. is still good all the time makes no difference how many lights they flip uh -huh. the light of the world is still in charge yes, sir. makes no difference whoever says what or whoever perpetrates a fraud uh -huh. ah. Jesus is still in charge yeah. 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 Huh. 
He, he is the authorized king. Behold, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He is the authorized one. And we thank God, praise God, for uh, the word uh -huh. and for who's in charge. At this time, we're here to report coming from Sister Kim. Good morning, Second Mount Zion. We have Teresa Holloman coming back under restoration. Yes. Amen. amen. Let your say amen. amen. Let's say it again. Amen. Say it one more time. We are delighted that you have decided to come back for restoration and how blessed we are. As pastor, I give you the right hand of welcome. Yes. To welcome you back into the fold. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. We are so delighted to have you. Thank you. Amen. So at this time, uh, you will see Sister Cheryl, and mm -hmm. she'll give you further instructions. Amen. 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 Let the church say it again. Let the church say it again. Let the church say it again. again, Second Mount Zion. On Saturday, December the 31st, watch night service will be at 3 p.m. There will be no Sunday service on January the 1st. Also, following service, you can come into the conference room to get your 2023 envelopes if you tie via using the envelopes. Thank you. Amen. It's tithing and giving time. The Lord. What kind of giver does the Lord love? Amen. We are ready to give. And if you need an envelope today, just raise your hand. The ushers will make sure that you have one. Amen. And, uh, yeah. and if you have not already given, take the time now to do it online, or if you had not already sent it through the mail, you may, you may uh, do your giving right now. Now is the time. And you can drop it in the baskets or in the tithing box on your way out. Tell me when the woman Jesus was born. Come on, Last month of the year. Oh, tell me when the woman Jesus was born. Last month of the year. We got January, mm -hmm. February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, it was last month of the year. Oh, tell me when woman Jesus born, last month of the year. And that's it. No, 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 no.
Let us stand. All things come of thee, O Lord. And of thine own have we given thee. You may remain standing and, and now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. The only one wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power that everybody said. Go in peace and serve the Lord.